Earlier this year, I won an international science competition. <laughs> and ever since then, a bunch of people have come up to me and asked, how on earth could a 15-year-old have come up with a new way to detect pancreatic cancer? My answer, a ton of hard work, a year and a half to be precise, and a ton of failures. Now, recently I developed a novel paper sensor for the detection of pancreatic, ovarian, and lung cancer and it's 168 times faster, over 26,000 times less expensive, and over 400 times more sensitive than the current gold standard of detection. The best part is... <laughs> the best part, it costs three cents and takes five minutes to run. Now, it all began one day when I decided to go online and start researching statistics on pancreatic cancer. We had recently lost a close family friend, who was like an uncle to me, who had succumbed to the disease of pancreatic cancer. What I found was eye-opening. Over 85% of all pancreatic cancers are diagnosed late, when a patient has less than a 2% chance of survival. That means less than two people out of every 100 die, or less than two out of every 100 survive. In addition, it is an abysmal five-year survival rate. Only 5.5% of people will survive after five years. The average lifespan of someone with pancreatic cancer is three months. One of my dad's friends, actually, suffered with pancreatic cancer, and a week later, he was dead. So I was wondering why we are so bad at detecting pancreatic cancer. What I found was eye-opening and shocking to me. Our modern medicine is a six-year-old technique. It's highly outdated and grossly inaccurate. It misses over 30% of all pancreatic cancers. In addition, it's pricey. It costs $800 per test, and it's not covered by insurance, so it's not an option for low-income patients. In addition, pancreatic cancer is a non-symptomatic disease. That means that all of its symptoms are really general, such as abdominal pain, jaundice, and so a doctor can't easily diagnose it. So then I started making a scientific criteria that I would imagine a sensor that was optimal would have. It would have to be simple, sensitive, selective, rapid, inexpensive, and minimally invasive to a patient. I was pretty confident that I could create such a sensor, but I wasn't quite sure how. And then I started doing a bit more research, and I found out why such a technological advancement hadn't been made. What I found is that, due to the daunting nature of the discovery, no work has really been done on this. What is happening with pancreatic cancer when you diagnose it? You're looking for a cancer biomarker, or a protein that's found at higher levels in your bloodstream. And this sounds really straightforward, but it's anything but. You see, you have all this healthy blood, liters and liters of healthy blood but you're looking for this tiny increase in this tiny amount of a protein that's next to impossible. Essentially, what you're doing is you're looking for a needle on a haystack, but worse, you're looking for a needle in a nearly identical stack of needles. And so then what I did is I began researching, because I had to find some target to look at, and I started actually with a database of over 8,000 different proteins found in pancreatic cancer. Luckily, on the 4,000th on the 4,000th try, I finally hit gold, and I found this protein that I could use. Its name was mesothelin, and it's just your regular protein, unless you have pancreatic, ovarian, or lung cancer, in which case it's found at a highly expressed level, a highly overexpressed, like really high levels in your bloodstream. And then the key about this protein is that it's found early in the disease, when a patient has close to 100% chance of survival. And so if I could detect this protein, then I could hopefully cure pancreatic cancer, basically. And so then I shifted my focus to trying to detect the protein, because that was the big question. And my breakthrough came in the most unlikely of places. It came in high school biology class, the absolute, like, abhorror of, like, innovation. So I basically smuggled in this article on single-walled carbon nanotubes that I had been dying to read. And a single-walled carbon nanotube is essentially an atom-thick tube of carbon that's, just imagine, a really long pipe, and it's 150,000th the diameter of your hair. 
And it has these amazing properties. They're super, super cool. And they're like the superheroes of material science. And so then I was trying to roll over this concept of we were learning about antibodies. And antibody is basically a lock and key molecule that attaches specifically to a certain protein, in this case, the mesothelin. And I was trying to combine that spe specific reactivity to how carbon nanotubes are really sensitive to their network, all the um, three-dimensional structures of their network. And then it hit me. What I could do is I could put an antibody in this network, such that it would react specifically to the mesothelin, and then also it would change its electrical properties based on that amount of mesothelin. Enough so that I could measure it with a $50 Home Depot ohm meter. So pretty easy. And just as I had this epiphany, my biology teacher storms up to me because she spotted me reading this article, snatches it out of my hand, and because I was supposed to be writing an essay, and then storms off and gives me a lecture. After class, I finally convinced her after a huge lecture on how I should respect her and her class. I finally got my article back, because that's all I really wanted from her. <laughs> and so then what I did is I began researching this promising idea. And then I need a lab space, because you can't do cancer research on your kitchen countertop. <laughs> and so basically what I did is I wrote up a budget, a timeline, a procedure, and materials list. So all the professors I emailed meant that I knew that I meant business. And so then what happened is I emailed 200 different professors at the National Institutes of Health and Johns Hopkins University, basically anyone who had anything to do with pancreatic cancer. Then I was kind of expecting to sit back and wait for positive emails to flow in, and I would get a pick and choose. <laughs> then reality took place, and over the course of a month, I got 199 email rejections. One of them went as far to systematically pop a hole in each part of my procedure. So it was a bit depressing. But there's one lukewarm maybe professor. I finally tracked him down after three months, nailed down an interview. So I go in with my knowledge of 500 plus journal articles I've read, and we start the interrogation. Because what happens is over the course of this hour-long interview, he calls in more and more experts, trying to pop holes in my um, solution. And I sit through all of it, and I answer all of his questions. I guessed on a few, though. And, <laughs> but the interrogation paid off. I got the lab space I needed. And then I started on a seven-month-long journey in order to finally find the solution. And it seemed, at first, nothing was working. Everything was really screwed up, and there were millions of holes in my procedure. And over the course of seven months, I slowly, painstakingly filled each and every one of those. And at the end, I ended up with a paper sensor that could detect 100% of all pancreatic, ovarian, and lung cancers. But I've learned a really important lesson over the course of my journey. What I've learned is that through the internet, anything is possible. Theories can be shared, and you don't have to be a professor with multiple degrees to have your values, um, your ideas valued. And regardless of your gender, your age, your ethnicity, regardless of anything, it's just your ideas that count. And to me, that's all that really matters. So redefining relevance for me is looking for new ways to use the internet. We really don't want to see your duck-faced pictures. <laughs> Instead, you could be changing the world with the internet. You could help detect pancreatic cancer. So if I could detect pancreatic cancer, just imagine what you could do. Thank you.